It's mail time! Oh, the best time of day when the other departments send you mail. There's a MacBook Air inside of here. Okay. Guess we should talk about this now. Sponsored by Linode. Hey guys, how are you all doing? If you're new here, welcome. My name is Crazy Ken, and Apple just launched the brand new M2 MacBook Air, and I'll be showing that off in a future episode when it arrives. But in the meantime, I've been nostalgic for the first gen MacBook Air. There were a lot of good things about the first gen MacBook Air, and there were some things that probably not everybody liked, depending on who you talk to. But regardless, it was a revolutionary product, at least in the Mac line itself, because it ushered forth many new features like the unibody enclosure. And we'll explore all that stuff today. So let's start with the MacBook Air's initial introduction at Macworld 2008. On January 11th, 2008, four days before Steve Jobs' keynote, Apple Insider posted a photo of a banner at the Moscone Center, reading, there's something in the air. Then on January 14th, Apple posted the same teaser on their website. And as you can imagine, the tech world was getting hyped up. And in hindsight, the clues for the new computer's name were in the teaser all along. Then on January 15th, Steve Jobs takes the stage. There's clearly something in the air today. Fun fact, in the original teaser, air was not capitalized, but on stage, it was capitalized. Pretty sneaky, Steve. After announcing several other products, including the launch of iTunes movie rentals, Steve teases item number four and repeats, there's something in the air. Then Steve officially announces the MacBook Air and says it's the world's thinnest notebook. He compared it to the Sony TZ series, and I'm pretty sure the audience's jaws dropped when he revealed the thinnovation of the iconic wedge shape. This is the MacBook Air. <laughs> and Steve talks about how three pounds is a good weight target. But other notebooks in this field compromised too much, and Apple didn't want to do that with MacBook Air. Apple wanted more performance, a full-size keyboard, and a full-size display. And then, one of my favorite Steve-isms of all time happens. The guy just walks over to the counter like he owns the place, which he kind of does, and then he just pulls out a freaking button and string delivery envelope and nonchalantly slides the MacBook Air out of it, revealing it to the world for the first time. What an amazing moment. And little did we know at the time, the first-gen MacBook Air was introducing a bunch of key innovations that would affect the future of the Mac line. But before we take a look at all that stuff, let's take a look at the specs of the first-gen MacBook Air. The MacBook Air featured a 13.3-inch LED backlit display at 1280 by 800 resolution and a full-size backlit keyboard. On top of the display is a built-in iSight camera, and inside there's 2GB of RAM and a 1.6GHz Intel Core 2 Duo with a 1.8GHz option. Graphics-wise, there's an Intel GMA X3100, and for storage, there's a 1.8-inch 80GB PETA hard disk and it's running at 4200 RPM. The ports are hidden behind a door, and they include one USB 2 port, one micro DVI, and a headphone jack. Not many ports on this thing, so don't expect to plug much in. At least Apple gives you some free conversion technology so you can adapt micro DVI to full-size DVI. Personally, I thought the door was kind of silly, but I guess it was necessary to help achieve the curve shape Apple was going for. I guess Apple just likes I.O. doors. They did the same thing on the first gen iMac. But when Apple changed the Air design in 2010, they 86 the door, which was probably for the better. On the other side is a MagSafe port, and the 37 watt hour battery was advertised with five hours of wireless productivity time. And all of this can be yours for the starting price of 1799 US dollars. The one spec that really stood out to me was the 1.6 gigahertz clock speed, simply because it was the slowest clock speed of any Mac at the time. But you gotta remember, this is a really tiny computer. In fact, the processor had to be specially engineered to fit inside this small package, which required Intel to make the CPU 60% smaller than normal. H how did we fit a Mac in here? <laughs> so those are the specs of the first gen MacBook Air. Now let's talk about the big changes that affected the future of the Mac line. And uh, we'll just start with the elephant in the room. The integrated battery. MacBook Air was the first MacBook with an integrated battery, or as some people may call it, a non-user replaceable battery. MacBooks at the time, even iBooks and PowerBooks, had simple mechanisms to allow users to remove and swap batteries without tools, but the MacBook Air did not have this. It wasn't terribly difficult to remove the battery, 
but it's not as easy as just flipping a switch or turning a knob. This had rippling effects. Future MacBook models all lost the battery hatch, and future future Mac models had the batteries glued in. Which makes sense because Apple does make custom shaped batteries to try to fill the volume as much as possible, and if you're also trying to shave thickness off a product, it's much thinner to use glue than to build frames and other housings around a battery compartment. So I think that's a fair trade-off. I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, but personally, the non-user removable battery has never bothered me. So with that aside, let's take a look at some of the other great changes the MacBook Air introduced. The MacBook Air was the first Mac notebook to introduce the unibody enclosure. Although this feature wasn't mentioned by name until October 2008 at Apple's event, Apple mentioned the unibody was conceived in the design of the original Air. Instead of starting with a thin piece of aluminum and adding structural components on top, Apple now started with a thicker piece and machined a chassis out of it and recycled the excess. And this unibody feature evolved and made its way into all future Mac notebooks, providing extra durability and greater thin ovation. And the familiar black chiclet style keyboard we still see today in Macs debuted with the MacBook Air. And along with the new keyboard is a new trackpad, which introduced new multi-touch gestures inspired by iPhone, such as rotate and pinch to zoom. And we still use these gestures every day on our newer Mac trackpads. And because Earth is important, I figured it'd be good to mention that the MacBook Air's product launch was also the first time Apple talked about their new environmental reports, which they continued to do at many future events. And now, we come to my favorite feature which debuted with the MacBook Air, solid state drives. Although the MacBook Air shipped with a 4200 RPM 80 gigabyte hard disk drive as standard, on checkout, you could upgrade it to a 64 gigabyte SSD for $999. Remember, it's 2008. Be very grateful that prices of SSDs have come down. <laughs> And the SSD ran so much faster than a mechanical disk. And in theory, it's also more durable because there's no moving parts. In fact, I have a third party SSD in this computer and it's about 14 years old, but it's still really snappy. A fresh new SSD can absolutely breathe life into an older computer. And this was an important change for the Mac line because as time went on, Apple offered more SSD upgrade options in all of their computers. Nowadays, if you go to Apple's website, you can't buy any new Mac with a mechanical disc in it. They're just not around anymore. And that's it for the MacBook Air. Okay, thanks for watching. Catch the crazy and pass uh, it on. Hey, Ken, aren't you forgetting something? Nope, I did not forget anything. We're good here. Come on, Ken, you gotta talk about it. Okay, fine. They, uh... They removed the optical drive. Speak up. They removed the optical drive. Okay, I said it. Did you get that, guys? They removed the optical drive. Hey, hey, you can't find it on there. They ripped it out and put it in a $99 external enclosure. Congratulations. Yes, it's true. Ever since optical drives went mainstream in Macs, every Mac had one, but the MacBook Air was the first to kill it off. Why did Apple do this? The easy answer is it wouldn't fit. If you look at how compact and thin the MacBook Air is, and then you place a DVD on top of it, you'll see it takes up a lot of valuable space. You don't get much out of them. If we're talking single layer DVDs, you're gonna get 4.7 gigabytes of storage, which is not really that much. And this might have upset some people at the time, but that just meant the product wasn't for you. Heck, even Steve Ballmer made fun of it. Where's your DVD drive? Let me look for that. <laughs> Anyway, like I mentioned earlier, if you needed a disk drive, Apple sold an external USB super drive for $99, or you could remotely use another Mac or PC's optical drive via the new remote disk feature. But remember, there's only one USB port on this thing, so if you have this thing plugged in, you literally cannot plug in any other USB peripheral. You are out of luck unless you have a hub. When you remove that optical drive, you free up a lot of space. So there's potential to make computers thinner and lighter. There's potential to add in bigger batteries, faster processors with bigger and better cooling systems. There's a lot of innovation that can take place when you 86 a big clunky piece of tech that's no longer needed anymore. Well, let's be honest. Nowadays, you probably barely think about using optical media with your modern computer, right? And speaking of modern computers, I will be doing a first impressions episode of the new M2 MacBook Air when it gets here, which will be really soon, so make sure you're subscribed for that. And I think it'll be really fun to do some comparisons side by side with the new one and the first gen MacBook Air, so I'm excited for that. And also special thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. And if you guys have an application or website that needs to be scaled or deployed, Linode has the infrastructure and the 24 seven support you need. Linode offers out of box apps 
for game servers like TF2, CSGO, and even Minecraft. You can run your own virtual private network with OpenVPN, build an online application with Joomla's content management system, or build a video streaming site with a multitude of app choices. There's so much you can do with Linode's affordable Linux virtual machines. And to boot, they offer award-winning 24-7 technical support. To put it simply, if it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. Visit linode.com slash computerclan and click the create free account button. And when you do that, I'll give you a 60-day $100 credit just for watching this episode. Pretty good deal. And also, you're supporting the Computer Clan when you do that. Thank you very much. By the way, I'm curious to hear your guys' initial reactions about the MacBook Air when it first came out, so feel free to leave a comment. MacBook Air ushered forth many new technologies and key features into the Mac line, and without them, Macs would be very different than they are today, and probably not for the better. So thank you, MacBook Air, for all you have done in the Mac line. And I cannot wait to try out your new version next week when it gets here. And I'll see you guys then. Catch the crazy and pass it on. Thank you.